Now I want to get to the main part of the presentation. We wanted to clearly articulate here, as Mr. Billa said, what are we going to do for the next five years? We are going to focus on four critical pillars that we are going to take you through today. The first part is growth, organic growth for both Novellis and Hindalco in India, which we will describe by taking you through the end markets, the growth potential, and the capexes that we plan to spend there. We're going to articulate to you our ESG strategy, which is very critical, and the specific things that we are doing on a whole variety of items, both on the environment, social, as well as the governance point of view. We will then take you through our deleveraging strategy with numbers on how much debt we intend to pay back and our net debt to EBITDA targets. And finally, we will describe to you shareholder returns, shareholder value creation, and our dividend policy. So these four are what we are going to cover over the next hour in great detail. With this, I, to take the first part of the growth strategy, I hand it over to Steve Fisher to take you through Novellis' market outlook and growth strategy. Over to you, Steve. Great. Thank you, Satish. Um, and good morning, good evening to everybody, and, and thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, as Satish said, I'll spend just a few minutes uh, uh, with you walking through uh, who Novellis is as far as what markets we serve and some of the uh, absolutely fantastic growth opportunities that we have in front of us. So for those of you um, uh, that are not as familiar with Novellis uh, as others, we are the world's largest aluminum uh, flat rolled producer. But even just as important, we're the world's largest recycler of aluminum. Now, when you take a look at uh, the global FRP aluminum market here on the left side of this uh, slide, it is a very large uh, and diverse market, as you can see. 28 million tons delivered in 2019 uh, through a number. Uh... Operator, can you hear me okay? Satish, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so you're loud and clear. We can hear you. All right, thank you. I just had some feedback that uh, someone was not hearing. Um, uh, uh, and, and you can see the diversity in the marketplace uh, of which uh, Flat World Products goes into now. Most importantly here is that this is a growing market at 3% compound uh, annual growth rate through 2025. And Novell Novellus uh, itself participates across many of these end markets, but with a focus on our premium uh, in markets that drive higher margins, such as beverage can, uh, automotive sheet, uh, aerospace plate and sheet, and a variety of special uh, specialty products. Our geographical footprint uh, is across four regions, 33 operating locations, and truly gives us the ability to leverage our global scale and footprint to serve our largest uh, global customers, but also to serve uh, regional needs in each of the four regions. And uh, with the recent acquisition of Alaris and our continued focus on organic growth, uh, our two uh, auto, uh, uh, cat, uh, our auto finishing lines, one in China, one in the US, and our uh, rolling, recycling, and casting uh, expansion in South America, we are well positioned uh, at Novellus to capture the tremendous market opportunity uh, that is in front of us as the uh, aluminum flat roll product industry leader. So with that, let me get into a, a little bit more details uh, by uh, each of these end markets. Uh, starting uh, here with our largest uh, end market, uh, beverage uh, packaging, uh, demand for lightweight uh, infinitely recyclable aluminum uh, beverage package uh, is uh, forecasted to grow at a very robust 3 to 5% across the world over the next several years. And at Novellus, we've always looked at CAN as a, a very re uh, recession or resistant part of our portfolio, and it continues to be providing reduced volatility uh, in our business during economic cycles, and uh, clearly seen that during COVID. But over the past few years, we've seen a resurgence in can, uh, uh, beverage can demand due to consumer preferences for sustainable packaging options. 
We're seeing uh, uh, driving a package mix shift from other sub, uh, substrates such as glass, steel, PET, towards aluminum. For example, if you look at the bottom right of this uh, chart here, you can see that just in the past year in Brazil, uh, uh, beer packaged in aluminum cans has risen from 52% to 58%. There is no doubt that this trend was already uh, beginning be before uh, COVID, but got accelerated during COVID. But we simply believe it was an acceleration of the trend and will remain post-COVID. Uh, another uh, area to, to watch is seeing new beverage types being launched more and more in uh, aluminum beverage cans. You can see in the upper right chart here that when these new beverage types such as sparkling water, spiked seltzer, or canned cocktails or energy drinks are being launched, they're being launched now much more in aluminum, moving from in 2014, 30% of that to now 67% in 2019. And so when you look at these trends, these trends have driven our customers, our can makers, to announce significant expansion of uh, can making facilities over the next two to three years. And certainly, uh, this is absolutely a sign that the can market will be a very, very attractive market post-COVID. Now, when you look at the global supply and demand for beverage can uh, capacity, uh, sheet capacity, even when you take in the surplus of can sheet capacity in China, we believe the overall supply and demand is relatively balanced. What's important though, is proximity to our customers. That is a, an advantage and it's an advantage to Novellus because we are the only aluminum flat roll product player with can capable, can capable production across all four major continents. And we continue to invest, we're investing uh, 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 for additional 100 kT of capacity in Brazil for, for CAN. Um, and you combine that with our uh, continued uh, continuous improvement initiatives, further balancing investments to uh, improve our recovery rates, deep bottlenecking of our facilities, and our driving of operation of, uh, uh, operational efficiencies, we are well positioned to capture the demand we see in this marketplace uh, over the next five years. Now, moving to uh, the automotive uh, in market, uh, auto OEMs continue to adopt aluminum structures and components to lightweight their vehicles, resulting in a robust demand in this market for aluminum. Global demand for our products remains unchanged at a 10% compound annual growth rate through 2025, even with the modest pullback in vehicle productions that we saw in 2020 due to the COVID pandemic. Now, why is that? It's because the mix of vehicles that are selling well are SUVs, pickups, electric vehicles, and luxury models. And it's these segments that are being protected and prioritized by auto OEMs because of uh, the margins they make on them, which also favors us because these are the models that have higher aluminum usage. For instance, Looking at just the truck and SUV segment, it has recovered sharply since the COVID uh, pandemic and is actually at pre-COVID levels at this point in time. And when you just dive into looking at North America truck and SUVs, it makes up 75% of all vehicles produced in the North American marketplace and is continued to, continuing to grow its share of the overall vehicle pie. So lightweighting vehicles with aluminum provides a number of benefits, whether it's re for regulatory compliance, for safety, or performance of these vehicles. But it is also for further supported by electric vehicles and the increased mileage uh, that is needed uh, from consumers of these vehicles, even when you think about e-commerce deliveries now uh, over the past year, increasing substantially in what they want to do with electric vehicles. Uh, Bloomberg uh, NEF 2020 uh, long-term electric vehicle outlook. Uh, its report outlines that um, there will be significant growth in electric vehicles from today, making up about 3% of global car sales 
to 10% of global car sales will be electric vehicles by 2025, growing to 58% by 2040. So a large opportunity for aluminum. And again, here, battery electric vehicles have a strong need for light weighting for this range. Now let's just uh, step back just for a moment to consider the relative size of uh, aluminum versus steel in this market. Aluminum sheet is only a 2 million ton market versus an 80 million ton steel uh, market today. This highlights an opportunity for uh, aluminum to continue to penetrate and see adoption across vehicle structures and components. Third-party research firm uh, Ducker Aluminum uh, released, in, uh, released a study in July 2020 that by 2030, the average pounds per vehicle of aluminum will reach 570 pounds. From today in 2020, 459 uh, pounds per vehicle. And this will be driven primarily, primarily by aluminum flat rolled sheet, which today represents about 23% of the total aluminum pounds per vehicle, growing to about 30% in 2030. So we, as we look at this, the growth will certainly come from both a mix of the continued adoption of parts that aluminum sheet provides today, such as hoods, doors, fenders, uh, body and white, but we will also innovate to extend, uh, uh, extend aluminum's reach in vehicles to high strength structural and safety components like A and B pillars, uh, crash bars, and the rapidly evolving battery boxes for electric vehicles. Just last week, we announced our strongest 7000 series uh, aluminum alloy designed for just these type of safety critical applications. And offers a clear alternative to the most advanced high strength steel products. So we will continue to leverage uh, our state of the art Novellus customer solution centers and launch new innovative partnerships uh, like uh, Alumobility, which we launched just last week to work with our customers to enable the continued adoption of aluminum, uh, aluminum solutions across the vehicle. Now, the Novella Specialties portfolio serves a diverse array of in markets and customers uh, around the world. We produce both a uh, light and thick gauge material, uh, ranging from container foil to electronics uh, to uh, commercial truck and trailers. And with the acquisition of Alaris, we've added significantly to our portfolio uh, commercial truck and tra uh, to commercial truck and trailers, heat exchangers, and uh, building and construction, which I'll come back to in a few minutes. Our global footprint and flexible capabilities in this diverse value stream uh, enables portfolio and capacity optimization. And our strategy here will focus on innovating high recycled content products, portfolio optimization, and capturing market tailwinds that we're seeing currently uh, driving uh, increased demand. We see very good market uh, demand in Asia due to growing uh, electronics markets. Um, obviously, a, a lot of people needing uh, at-home electronics right now um, uh, driving that marketplace. Very solid demand in Europe as well, where we're, we are providing uh, innovative, sustainable sheet for building and packaging solutions. And tailwinds are probably most uh, pronounced in the North America marketplace, uh, where 50% of our specialties portfolio now resides after the Laris acquisition. And following that acquisition, Novellus North America is firmly number one in commercial truck and trailer, in building and construction, and in, conta uh, in container sheet sales. The demand in North America is supported by strong US housing fundamentals, continued light weighting trends, and increased E uh, commerce driving up truck trailer demand and favorable uh, trade cases. And with the recycled content 
of the continuous cast building and construction business we acquired being greater than 90 percent that is driving up the average north america specialist portfolio now above 75 percent recycled content allowing us to further drive towards a more circular economy now lastly uh, with the acquisition we gained entry into the premium uh, aerospace market and while this is a high value add uh, area and market. It is a relatively small market. Globally, even pre-COVID, this is less than a 400 KT global market. And for Novellus, it's less than 5% of our total shipments. So we're absolutely uh, glad to, to, to bring this into our portfolio, to grow this, uh, to use some of the technology in other parts of our business. Um, but as you can appreciate, uh, with the short-term reduction in consumer travel, uh, we are seeing muted demand uh, for the near term. However, the long-term demand is fundamentally supported by multi-year commercial airframe order backlog. Novellus is well positioned to capture this long-term aircraft demand. Uh, first, just due to our financial position uh, that will be an advantage in an industry needing to recover from distress across the entire supply chain. Second advantage is the shift of aircraft delivery demand towards Asia Pacific, which you can see in the bottom right uh, of this chart. This is uniquely positioning Novellus as the only Western supplier with plate qualified in China in an industry with very high barriers to entry. And finally, uh, carbon reduction efforts and conversations with uh, uh, air, uh, aircraft OEMs are gaining momentum. And we believe here we can leverage our long history in recycling to help uh, advance a circular economy in, air, uh, in the aero industry, like we've done in the auto through sophisticated closed loop recycling systems. Now, uh, with the strong market conditions that I just talked about, with innovative products that we continue to work on and launch, with solid customer partnerships, uh, our financial uh, strength, financial flexibility, coupled with decades of manufacturing and recycling experience at Novellus, we continue to see robust growth and organic investment opportunities for many years to come. As you can see in the uh, upper left of this chart, we are currently at roughly 4 million metric tons of capacity, including uh, the acquisition of Alaris and including the expansion at Penda. We will then turn our focus to China, uh, where we'll add a cold mill uh, and, and a release capacity at Olson, increasing our overall capacity uh, to point, uh, by point 0.2. And then we see a line of sight through uh, continued optimization of our operations and balancing investments that don't come with a lot of capital to get to 4.5 million metric tons of rolling capacity. With the two auto uh, lines nearing completion, uh, that will increase our overall auto shipments to roughly 1,000 KT, but we will remain committed to the beverage can business and a diversified uh, specialties portfolio. Our strategy to defend and grow uh, and diversify our business remains absolutely unchanged and while there's nothing new to announce today we have approximately 1.5 billion of growth capital uh, over the next five years earmarked in our strategic plan uh, for further uh, uh, organic growth we will begin uh, first uh, with our china expansion to fully integrate that facility with our downstream auto finishing lines and drive the 65 million of uh, of synergies that we've talked about. We will continue to implement our world-class manufacturing, automation, and digital initiatives and advancements in R&D to unlock further capacity, uh, capture further growth that we see in the marketplace, and to support our sustainability initiatives. We will also be very focused uh, on uh, further uh, opportunities around casting and recycling capacity uh, we have identified some projects here, um, and this will uh, obviously support uh, carbon reductions that we'll be talking about. 
There will also be uh, further automotive finishing opportunities with a 10% compound annual growth rate uh, that will come uh, over the next five uh, plus years. And what's unique here is Novellus has the strength and financial flexibility to invest this 1.5 in these areas over the next five years and continue to meet our deleveraging and uh, return uh, commitments that we'll be talking about further today. Now here, this is a few of the projects that we've already announced that are underway uh, on this slide. Um, for the most part, the capital spending on the auto finishing lines of, uh, of Kentucky uh, in the U.S. and Chengzhou in China is for the most part behind us. Uh, those have started to um, uh, deliver commercial coils, the U.S. line in December of last year and the Chengzhou China line in January of this year. We'll continue to qualify with other customers and ramp up those two lines over the next several months and next several years in, years in line with what our customer uh, order book looks like, which is very strong. Pinda is on track, uh, on time. Uh, we'll see that commission uh, near the end of fiscal 22. Again, that's a full uh, rolling, recycling, and casting expansion for 100 KT. We'll turn our focus this year uh, to starting and kicking off the uh, China integration, which is approximately $300 million. Uh, it's a new cold mill, allowing us to uh, fully integrate uh, the uh, Chenzhan mill with our Chengzhou uh, facility, uh, driving 65 million uh, in synergies. But it also will be the first ever closed loop recycling system for automotive inside of China, uh, which will also provide a lot of benefits to our customers. And it frees up capacity at Olson then uh, to allow us to sell further specialties uh, or uh, beverage uh, can. Uh, the timing of that project after we kick it off is roughly two to two and a half years. So again, a lot of exciting opportunities in front of Novellus uh, over the next five years and look forward to talking more about uh, some of these uh, organic uh, opportunities uh, and when, when the time uh, comes to talk more uh, publicly about them. With that, um, I'm going to turn the call over now to, Prave to Praveen to talk through uh, the Indian uh, downstream uh, opportunities and growth strategy. Praveen. Thanks, uh, Steve. And uh, just like you saw the entire uh, growth strategy for Nobilis, I will now take you through the growth capex and strategy for the Indian business, uh, which is primarily focused on downstream as we've been talking to you in various uh, of our communications and interactions. Uh, we are focusing more on downstream because we believe downstream is more value added. It is less uh, amenable to fluctuations with LME pricing. It is closer to the customer. And particularly in India, there is a clean runway for us to capture this market because there are not many players which are uh, of our size and scale. And we can actually capture a lot of value out there. So taking uh, you through uh, the different uh, segments, business segments, the first is the aluminum segment, which is the largest part of our business. And you, as you notice here, the global demand is 90 million tons, but the Indian demand at the moment is only 3.7 million tons. So average per capita consumption in, alumina, in India for aluminum is very, very low compared to the uh, global standards. And it shows that there is a huge potential for India to grow in aluminum demand. But if you look at the different market segments, globally, packaging, construction, and transport are the big sectors. In India, packaging and construction are still low, and transport put together, they are still pretty low compared to the global standard. So there's a lot of scope to grow here. Coming to the product segments, uh, extrusion and FRP globally are the two largest segments. In India, they represent um, almost half of what global standards are. And this is where we are present in a big way in both FRP and extrusion. In fact, in FRP, we are the only large, uh, large scale organized player in this area, uh, which is recognized by the customers as a quality for, for its quality products. Uh, in extrusion, again, we are the uh, we are one of the big ones. And therefore, we see a lot of potential out there. We believe that like in case of global demand, extrusion and FRP are going to grow much, much faster than the other parts of the uh, product segments. So we are basically present in the dominant, we are dominant in those segments which are likely to grow dramatically 
over the next few years uh, in India. Where is it uh, used largely? So in terms of the segments, we have building and construction segment, uh, where you are aware that India is putting a lot of focus on the housing demand and creating infrastructure for people to live in. And this is going to consume a lot of aluminum going forward. Various applications like doors and windows, roofings, claddings, curtain walling, etc. Many such applications for aluminum are present in building and construction segment. Transport and automotive, again, like you've seen in the global context, in India as well, transport and automotive uh, has a lot of potential for aluminum. With BS6 uh, in place in India, this will drive the sales of aluminum and aluminum made cars in a big way because of the light weighting. Uh, various applications like engine castings, power chain parts, cylinder blocks, alloy wheels, etc., and many of them would use extrusion and FRP, is going to drive the uh, aluminum usage in transportation. Packaging, we are already present in a big way, in the, particularly in the foil stock and the foil related areas, uh, which is used in pharmaceutical in a large way, but also food and beverage industry. Liquor uses the bottle caps, etc. FMCG industry also uses it. So plenty of usages in the packaging side and aluminum provides certain unique advantages over other forms of materials, which will help it to grow very, very significantly going forward. There are many other segments like electronics and electricals, consumer durables, uh, aluminum cookware, machinery and equipment. So defense, nuclear, railways, ships and boat building, etc. There are many areas where aluminum is increasing its presence, and this is going to help us in terms of invading that market. Overall, uh, we believe that the, the growth is going to be significant. We expect that by 2030, total aluminum consumption will be almost doubling from the current level to about over 7 million tons. A large part of that will be from FRP and extrusion, which, is the, which, is, which are the segments where we are currently present and will continue to grow. The next <clears throat> large business segment for us is the copper market. In copper, again, first of all, copper, refined copper demand is likely to grow by about 7 to 8% in the next 8 to 10 years uh, from the current levels. And as you are aware, we are the only large uh, refined copper manufacturing plant uh, in the country. And we are also the largest uh, rod manufacturers at the moment, which is the downstream product for copper. In India, copper demand is largely in the form of rods, which is the downstream product for copper business. Uh, large applications of copper is in the form of uh, electrical applications, which goes into building and housing wires, automotive wires, railway systems, industrial cables, motor winding wires, etc., transformer strips and all that. So really speaking, almost everywhere where electricity is going to be used, copper and copper rods are the ones which are going to actually take the center stage. And we being the uh, big player in this area, we command a premium as well as we are likely to grab the opportunity that is available in the Indian market. Uh, on the infrastructure side, railway electrification is a major push from the government. Metro network and high-speed railways, they are going to drive the uh, demand for copper and copper alloys in this system. So this is another area where we are going to capture uh, the opportunity that is available. There's one more area which is related to the air conditioning and refrigeration system heat exchangers and plumbing industry. This is where tubes are used. And a particular type of use is, is tube is called inner group tubes, which is used for these kinds of applications. This is another part of the segment, which is growing very rapidly and is likely to offer a good opportunity for us. We are talking about all these things because our projects are related to these segments and you will see how we are trying to capture them. There is a third segment, uh, which is called specialty alumina uh, segment. Uh, traditionally, you've seen that this segment is clubbed uh, into aluminum segment for our results. But really speaking, this is a non-metallurgical alumina, which is used in certain niche applications, and it is different from the metallurgical use of this alumina. Uh, typically, it's a, it's a mix of hydrate and alumina, which are the intermediate products also for aluminum. But we do some special treatments to them 
and they become value added products for us and are supplied to various different kinds of industries and they uh, this is also a profitable segment for us some of the characteristics of alumina actually make it uh, amenable to these usages and those are that it's its ability to withstand very high levels of heat it is a very tough and therefore provide strength so for example in refractories which are used in particularly in steel industry and other industries as well refractories consume a lot of specialty alumina which actually help uh, uh, help build these uh, fact uh, refractories similarly in making of glasses it can provide strength as well as clarity ceramics again strength plays a lot of role there wires and cables particularly the pvc and composites that's where these uh, these products are used today in india it is likely to grow at about 7% in the next uh, next few years globally the growth is about 3% we are the only manufacturer of these products in the country and even globally there are very few players who actually specialize in these products but we in our uh, particularly in our belgaum factory we have been making this for a long period of time and we have the expertise to capitalize on the opportunities that are offered in this area there are many future applications also which are very promising which include lithium ion batteries leds advanced ceramics electronics all these segments are likely to grow significantly in future and therefore this particular segment also has a has a very bright uh, future in our overall segments i will now take you uh, through the uh, specific numbers of how we look at the uh, value added products in terms of capacities and what do we intend to do these three segments are represented in these three boxes so the first one aluminum vap so you will notice that the primary metal capacity is currently at 1.3 million tons and we do not see this going up uh, over the next few years uh, it is likely to remain here but what is actually significantly changing is the uh, value added products capacity which is in the downstream segment we are currently at 320 kt which with the focus that we are putting on this segment we are likely to see a doubling of this capacity in the next 5 years both in frp and extrusion we are likely to invest uh, while we have not talked about the in terms of capex beyond 5 years but our thought process is that we should be able to triple this capacity from the current level uh, in the in the period beyond 5 years so really speaking what we intend to say here is that this is our current focus and this is likely to continue to grow here uh, the advantages of doing this as i mentioned earlier it is dealing from the lme fluctuations more stable cash flows higher value added products and of course closer to the customer and we have the first mover advantage here because really speaking uh, we being the large player here the only large player particularly in frp uh, we are likely to capture that center stage much much earlier than any other competitor in copper value added products first i'll talk about the overall cathode capacity we have about 421 kt of cathode making capacity so this is our refining capacity at the moment in copper business we intend to get into more recycling this includes a little bit of recycling as well at the at the current level including concentrate and recycling but we intend to add 100 kt of recycling capacity here and refining so that the total overall capacity for the primary cathode goes up from 421 to 521 beyond 5 years we believe that there would be a scope for another smelter and therefore a 250 kt smelter should be in place uh, in in the period that we envisage beyond 5 years but what is important is that the downstream part of it which is the rods and the uh, tubes and alloy rods we should be able to take up our current capacity of 315 kt in downstream to about 445 in the next 5 years and to about 655 beyond 5 year horizon as well so downstream will continue to gain focus even in copper business as well in this specialty alumina the total non metallurgical hydrates and alumina are at about 400 kt at the moment which will grow to 440 and 450 in the in the 5 years and beyond but what is important here is that the value added products within the non metallurgical grade will move up from 314 to 384 in the next 5 years itself and we see potential for growing it to 410 going forward as well so in a nutshell what we are trying to emphasize here is that 
the downstream part of all the three segments is going to continuously grow. And we are going to put a lot of focus uh, in this side of the segment. It also addresses the question of uh, expanding the ROCE and ROE because these are likely to be highly value added products uh, in our portfolio. A quick look at some of the projects uh, which are identified. We may not have announced all of them at the moment, but this, these are that shows our thought process. So first is of course uh, Alumina in the Utkal, which is uh, already announced and which is actually nearing completion uh, in the next few months. Uh, this is a 500 KT uh, project, Alumina project, as you all know. Utkal is our lowest cost uh, refinery globally. And this really adds a lot of value to us. This is at a cost of $200 million. Other uh, uh, value-added products, including recycling in aluminum, are today we are looking at about $650 million. There are some part of the projects which are already underway. This is 50 kT of hard alloys finishing assets. There is a 34 kT extrusion that we have already announced in Silvasa. So that is already under process now, just begun. And there are more capacities to be added on the FRP and recycling over the next few years. In copper, as we talked about, there will be inner group tubes and alloy rods. There will be some recycling and there will be some additional rod projects as well, totally amounting to about $200 million. In specialty, again, as I said, 70 KT will get added uh, at a cost of about $40 million. So close to a billion dollar, a little over a billion dollar uh, is something that we see as a potential for uh, the downstream projects. Uh, in Indian operations. All these, I'm sure, uh, will be very beneficial for the, uh, for the company. We have a very uh, detailed process of evaluation of each of these projects, and they all have synergies with our existing operations. So this was a brief summary of the Indian side of growth story. I would like to hand over uh, the mic to Satish now to take us through the ESG part of our initiatives. Yeah, thank you, Praveen. Um... And now I'm going to uh, articulate to you our ESG strategy. I think we're going to take this uh, investor show to uh, put out in front of you some clear commitments that we are going to take from an ESG point of view. Firstly, on the environment, the consolidated Hindalco will continue with the, uh, a renewed focus on increasing the recycle content. We commit to net carbon neutrality by 2050. We commit to zero waste to landfill by 2050. We commit to water positivity by 2050 and a no net loss on biodiversity by 2050. And I'm gonna take you through uh, quite a few specific projects on what we are gonna do in the next five years along this path. From a social point of view, as I told you, we are focused on running a safe operations with zero harm. We commit to a diversity and uh, inclusive policy. We are committed, as you know, to community and society, along with the creation of sustainable livelihood. And we also affirm strongly to human rights. From a governance point of view, we commit to the highest levels of value and transparency, strict adherence to a code of conduct, a best in class corporate governance, the highest level of information security and cyber security, which is pretty relevant in the world today, and a very strong customer and supplier centricity. So as we go through now, I just wanted to point out, as I think most of you were aware, that last year the Dow Jones Sustainability Index ranked us as the number one aluminum company. In the recently published Sustainability Yearbook of 2021, Hindalco has been rated in the gold class compared to some of our competitors, well-known ones that you can see in the bronze class. And I think that the point I want to make, which will set the ground for the, the slides that will follow, is that we are focused on net carbon zero, but we also take a much broader holistic view to sustainability and the environment. So we will talk, as you will see, from a carbon point of view, but also on waste, on water, on biodiversity, on the circular economy. All these is what we take under our ESG commitment. And I think this has been recognized by the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, and hence that they have put us in the gold class. 
with that now i wanted to uh, let steve take you through a few of the slides on what novelis has been doing steve over to you steve you'll have to unmute uh, steve request yep yeah can you hear me now yes okay uh, thank you again, Satish. Um, and as you all can uh, appreciate, as the world's uh, largest recycler of aluminum, uh, sustainability has always been at the heart of who we are as a company. <clears throat> and and we'll absolutely continue to guide our strategic decision making, as well as where we'll invest to grow our business uh, moving forward. As you can see here, recycling content uh, has increased significantly over the past decade, up 29 points from 30% to 59%, driving significant carbon reductions. Um, but we've also, as Satish uh, highlighted, made uh, great progress in other areas, <clears throat> whether it be energy reduction, water, uh, or waste reduction. Now, with the recent acquisition uh, of Alaris, uh, we are uh, currently in the process <clears throat> of evaluating the right framework and standards uh, to adopt to make further strides towards um, certainly reducing our carbon footprint and towards a number of other KPIs uh, in this area. Um, but most importantly to us is progressing towards the aluminum industry to progress uh, its journey towards a more circular uh, economy itself. Now, um, attaining a truly circular economy uh, will be uh, challenging uh, to any uh, material type. It will be a journey, and it absolutely will need to take into account uh, a product's full life cycle. With that being said, aluminum is infinitely recyclable, highly durable, retains its properties indefinitely, making it a perfect candidate for a circular economy. Nearly 75% of all aluminum ever produced is still in use today. And producing aluminum from recycled inputs requires 5% of the energy requirements associated, uh, versus primary, therefore 5% of the associated greenhouse gas emissions. Just last year, Novellus recycled 74 billion used beverage cans alone. And when we can get those used beverage cans back, we can turn them right back into another can within 60 days and put them right back on the shelf over and over and over, infinitely recyclable. That is what truly a circular economy looks like. But aluminum uh, recycling goes well beyond, for us now, uh, just used beverage cans. It goes into sophisticated closed loop recycling systems that we've set up with our auto manufacturers, uh, starting with Ford. And here, uh, we set up a system when we started to deliver to Ford to ensure that we got all their process scrap right back segregated into our plants so that we could recast it, re-roll it, finish it, and send it back to Ford. This program is unbelievable in that it produces 30,000 F-150 bodies every month. That is truly uh, a great example, again, of what we mean by a circular economy. Uh, since 2011, we've invested um, uh, uh, over 700 million in recycling capacity, bringing our total recycling capacity to 2.5 million metric tons. And we've identified further opportunities uh, in, in this 1.5 billion that we've talked about over the next five years to expand further uh, recycling and casting capacity because we know what it does uh, from a carbon footprint and we know uh, this is being a, a big pull from our customers. But collaboration <clears throat> is gonna be key to understanding the product's full life cycle. So we will work with our customers uh, to ensure that we understand exactly what we need to do from aluminum uh, so that we can find ways to uh, continue to expand the use of lightweight, infinitely recyclable aluminum to create more sustainable, recyclable products and promote a more circular economy. With that, Satish, I'll turn it back to you. So uh, talking about uh, ESG, let me now take you through uh, what I meant was a more holistic approach. So starting on this slide, the first thing is about water positivity. 
Hindalco in India uses nearly 76 cubic uh, meters of water. And I think that, you know, we recycle about 18 million. So I think that uh, getting to a zero water discharge in our plants is a key consideration. Today, 11 of our 15 plants are zero water discharge. And in the next few years, we would like to convert all the remaining four, which are really the older plants like Renukut, the Hage and Hirakut to zero water discharge. This is a firm commitment that we have made and we are progressing towards reaching this target in the next few years with projects and investment clearly identified. Talking about green cover and biodiversity, as you very well know from a statutory point of view, we have to cover 33% of the available plant space with a green cover. Hindalco has taken this scientifically and gone much deeper. We have planted about 2.6 million trees. We have 1,817 hectares covered under green cover. And we will be taking this 33% to much more than 50% uh, over the next few years. Greening it on one hand allows you to uh, so take up CO2 from the air, but it also gives you oxygen into the air. And there are quite sophisticated models that actually give you the value of doing this green cover. So we uh, track this and it is in the KRA of each plant manager, the greening percentage of his or her plant. So for us, this is a key KRA for all our management. Now going on to biodiversity. Going on to the next topic, which is the circular economy. Bauxite residue, we generate about 3 million tons. And on fly ash, we generate about 4.3 million tons. In bauxite residue, we actually lead the world when it comes to its recycling. Today, we have reached 62%, a vast majority of it, going to cement plants to replace laterite. But we also use it for embankment, road building. And now we have a unique project on mine backfilling that we are working with the government in India, which is actually being monitored on an international level. Because if you can then take the bauxite residue back to the bauxite mine, then you can establish a complete circular economy with no need for further landfills or tailing dams, as they call it. So in bauxite residue, we think that we are very quickly in the next few years going to get to 100% recycling. If you take fly ash, last year we have reached 82%, but this year post-COVID, we are actually beyond the 100%. Largely, the fly ash goes to cement plants, but also to making bricks and other technologies that we have invested in. On the fly ash side, we will be over 100% recycled. We are actually taking fly ash from some of our older storage facilities and sending them to cement plants now. The third point, which is uh, a Hindalco and a Novellis consolidated target, we are all committed to making our sites completely single plastic free, single use plastic free. Uh, most of our plants today are single use plastic free, but we have started to get uh, independent certification. So three of our plants from the CII now have been certified as single use plastic free. And this we uh, intend to do across all sites of the consolidated Hindalco. Let me tell, talk to you a little bit more on biodiversity. As a mining company, this is where Hindalco will really differentiate itself against our international competition. We are working with the International Union for the Conservation of National Resource, Natural Resources to come up with biodiversity management plans. We already have them for four of our sites, the large mines like Papri Mali and the Garipalma sites, where we do a comprehensive no net loss. That means flora, fauna, as well as life organisms that were there. And this biodiversity plan done with the IUCN actually allow us to reach a point of no net loss of biodiversity. So from an ESG point of view, I, I think this is very critical, especially for the mining industry and towards sustainable mining. And Hindalco actually is taking a leading role internationally in this no net loss on biodiversity. I told you right at the beginning, both Hindalco and Novellis are committed towards zero harm. So you can see here, we, we run a very focused safe operations 
Our loss time injury frequency rates are among the industry best, both in Hindalco, which I've presented, as well as Novellis. Uh, it's uh, mandatory for all management to be, th they are held personally accountable for all safety incidents that happen in their plant. So I think from a safety point of view, we can confidently say that the consolidated Hindalco is right up there among the world's best companies. Let me now talk about aluminum specific energy and the carbon footprint. As you know, this is the weakest point for the upstream business in India. Our power for aluminum smelting largely comes from coal, but we have embarked on a very detailed strategy to reduce this carbon footprint. On one hand, we have reduced the specific energy used to make aluminum by 25% from FY18 to FY21, and we are committed to progress down that slope with another 25% reduction over the next five years. But besides the specific energy reduction, we are focused on increasing the use of renewable energy. As you know, we already have 42 megawatts and we are going to, we have already got projects under, underway for another 42. So we'll be 100 megawatts of solar by the end of, or middle of next year to end of next year. And we are focused on putting another 200 odd megawatts over this five year time frame. We also have probably India's first 20 megawatts renewable hybrid with solar, wind, and battery technology being put in place with General Electric for the H. Besides that, we intend in our journey towards the net uh, zero net carbon by 2050 to start to use natural gas in a big way in our smelting processes. So currently we are trying to, to convert our casting furnaces to natural gas and soon even the smelting boilers, we are going to start to use natural gas as the pipelines that the government of India is laying down start to give us natural gas. This is probably, and I'm being very transparent, our most difficult challenge for the whole to get to the net zero, net carbon zero by 2050. But I, what I wanted to assure you is that we have specific progress, specific projects and investments that we are going to make. And you're going to see and we are going to present these every year to show you how we are progressing towards the net zero carbon. Lastly, um, as Steve was saying, I think the circular economy is really critical to make this world uh, from a sustainability point of view there. So I wanted to highlight uh, in India, we have taken a leading role in converting aluminum railway wagons, railway wagons to aluminum. We have launched an aluminum trailer, an aluminum bulker. The first aluminum bus, all aluminum designed by the ARAI will be launched by Mr. Billa in the first week of March. The packaging has, we are working a lot on aluminum laminated jute bags to get rid of plastic bags. And of course, we are working on an aluminum LPG cylinder. If you actually read the slide, you will see that the aluminum usage in bulkers trailers also reduces the fuel used. One liter of diesel actually emits 2.68 tons of CO2. So by reducing the amount of diesel consumed, we are reducing the carbon that is emitted. And on the same side, it is also making the energy use a lot more efficient. The, the bulkers and trailers, they last longer. They don't corrode, the maintenance costs are less. So we are quite focused on a product stewardship strategy in India that will help to reduce the carbon footprint. On the Novellis side, we have already talked to you about the sustainable packaging with the cans and beverages, as well as the circular economy that we are working on on the automotive side. Aluminium battery enclosure which are going to be needed in electric vehicles are up to 50% lighter than the equivalent steel design and extends their vehicles range by up to 10% further on a single charge. So if you see our ESG strategy, we talk about carbon, but we talk about waste, we talk about water, we talk about biodiversity, we talk about the circular economy and a life cycle product stewardship. So this we wanted to highlight to you is a comprehensive ESG strategy that Hindalco has adopted that has positioned us among the leading companies in the world. So we talked to you about growth and the projects that we had in Novellis and in Hindalco, India. 
we talked to you about our ESG strategy. And now I'm going to turn over, turn you over to Dev to talk about the deleveraging and the capital allocation and the shareholder returns. Over to you, Dev. Thank you, Satish. So a key tenet of our capital allocation framework is the continued focus on reducing net leverage, mainly as a function of a reduction of gross debt. On a consolidated Hindalco basis, we are aiming to reduce total debt by 2.9 billion US dollars within two years from its peak on June 30th, 2020, following the LRS acquisition. The vast majority of the gross debt reduction, that is 2.6 billion since the June 30th position, will come via Novellus through three main areas. First is the repayment of the entire 1.1 billion short-term bridge loan that was taken out to finance a portion of the LRS acquisition. This acquisition has proven its success in our ability to achieve targets and repay this bridge earlier than anticipated as a result of strong cash flow, sale proceeds, and stronger than expected synergy cost savings. Of the 1.1 billion loan, 500 million has already been repaid through the December quarter with the balance to be paid by the end of this quarter. Additionally, Novellus has also already repaid 900 million of short-term borrowings since June, primarily by reduction of the ABL. Lastly, Novellus has a $1.7 billion term loan due in 2022. We expect to refinance 1.1 billion of this term loan by the middle of the first quarter of fiscal 2022 and repay the balance 600 million before its maturity next calendar year. So of the 2.6 billion reduction at Novellus, 2 billion will have been repaid by the end of this fiscal 2021. The standalone Hindalco business also has a debt reduction plan in place. Hindalco plans to refinance just a portion of its Indian rupee bonds due 2022 and repay 270 million in US dollars by maturity date. As a result of meaningful debt reduction actions, both at Novellus and in India, we have a clear path to reducing consolidated net debt to EBITDA leverage to 2.5 times, better than pre-LRS acquisition levels in less than two years time. 